All righty then. On the ones and twos, I think folks are here. Maybe folks are coming in. Let me, so I'm trying to learn how to do a new system. That's what you're seeing as I spill root beer on things. Sorry if I'm a little glitchy. Um, I apologize. But you should be able to hear me clearly. So I apologize for the glitchiness. Actually, so because my computer is older, she be having some issues. So I'm going to just say hi to people as they come in. Give me a second. Oh, we got 12 folks. Hello. Hello everyone. Sorry that it's a bit glitchy. I hope it's not as glitchy as time go on. Let me try to log out as, as many things as I can to help with the stream. Santa didn't bring me a new computer either, Val. Hello, Kim. I'm going to let more people come on in. This is a new streaming thing that um, I'll be doing today, tomorrow, and Sunday. I'm doing all of my end of the year content live. Let me know if you can hear me, even though I'm a bit glitchy. Wish it wasn't so glitchy, but you know, here we are. I'm just trying to see if there's something else I can do. Nope. Okay, you can hear me just fine. It's just gonna be a situation. Happy New Year's! How's everyone doing? Um, I can't wait to talk to y'all about the best crime fiction of 2022. Um, let me know what y'all think about the setup. Um, I'm just so, so happy to, to start talking about, you know, what I got planned here. So the way that this is set up is that, <coughs> sorry, I'm going to go through all of the books that are the best crime fiction that I read last year. And then at the end, I'm going to, you know, open it up for, you know, some final thoughts for a couple minutes from y'all. And, you know, that's how we're going to do it. Um, I'm excited to get into the, the meat and the bones of some of my favorite things. And let me actually try to use this which I hope my computer is going to be okay with, but um, I have to use this mic. So let me get my life together here. Hmm. Can y'all still hear me? Maybe the mic is, we'll do the mic later. 
The mic will be for the next uh, live show. We'll figure that out then. All right. Now that folks are coming on in, let's go ahead and get started with the best crime fiction. Y'all going to be my test group with me doing this setup. Let's see how it goes, okay? None of these are in any particular order, but I thought I'll just, you know, start rambling them out. Um, I see that it's very popular for folks to do, like, top ten. I'm going to tell you right here, some of my list that I'll be giving y'all for end-of-the-year content is, like, 20 books, 18 books. So I'm going to be judged on that. Um, I hope the video is improving because it's a real struggle. All right, starting with Blood on the Tracks, um, if y'all can just engage with me and put like, put a red emoji, doesn't matter what it is, if you read Blood on the Tracks. Blood on the Tracks is a manga written by um, Shuzu Oshimi. I hope that I'm spelling or pronouncing that manga could name correctly. Blood on the Tracks follows the story of two people, a young boy and his mom, and while you're starting to first start and read the series, there is a thick layer of eeriness. You're unsure on exactly the nature of the relationship between mom and son. And things just get dark and dark and dark. And he is having to figure out how to exist in the world where to his mom, she he's everything to her so if i go any further i'll end up spoiling it what i do on my shelf right now i would pull it out but that'd be too much work i currently own volume one through nine and i've read one through six so i really enjoyed reading this book um or these books in this volume but it is also unsettling so if you're not into horror that is unsettling and makes you physically uncomfortable to read this is not the book for you but if you're looking for a fast-paced horror manga to get through that um it's not gonna just tell you everything on the page and you've got to kind of use your imagination um and really pay attention to the artwork to understand other levels of the story all right next one you're invited. You're invited by Amanda um, Jayatisa. is a beautiful story that I just finished recently. It follows the story of uh, our main character and our main character. Did I say that right? Yeah, our main character. She is just kind of falling apart a little bit and just life is life for her. And she gets an invitation to a wedding and it's a wedding that's being hosted by her ex-best friend and her ex-boyfriend so she has to make the decision of how she's gonna attend if she's gonna attend and she has a goal to break up this wedding she do not want this wedding to happen at all so you watch her go through the motions of breaking up this wedding what i really love about amanda's writing is that She's not going to give it to you all right away. You're going to be in the last chapter and be like, what the f did I just read? And I really thought I knew what was happening, but I really have no clue. And also in her writing and in her character development, you may think because you're reading from X perspective that you have a really good working understanding of the complexity of the character. And then you realize that you actually know nothing. And you're just out there fighting for your literary life. And that is what this book did to me. The Good House by Tanana Reef Du. If you're new to this channel, you know how much I feel about Tanana Reef Du. She is my favorite black um, horror writer. Uh, and then Brandon Massey is right below. And then um, Amanda... Uh, would come after that and then Jean Nicole Rivers not that you needed all that but these are some um, black horror writers that I truly appreciate so the good house follows the story of this woman 
and her grandmother dies. And they're living in what I would say it's kind of like a Jim Crow South community. Um, but it's like nice racism. If you know, if you know, you know. And while she is returning to this house, she's returning with her son. And she is starting to figure out or be told different stories about her family, her mother, and her grandmother that she didn't know. And I really love the way the story starts off. It brings us in the past, then brings us to the present, and then brings us back and forth. And it's done in such a beautiful way that you just can't help but to fall in love with Tanana Reeve Dew's writing. And there's some pretty hard things that happen in this book. I would say, you know, be conscious of the content warnings of, you know, child abuse, um, dog abuse or pet abuse, um, interpartner violence, uh, suicide, suicidal ideation, kind of things like that. So be aware that those contents exist here. Um, what I like most about this book was the intertwining of root magic in a modern way and really trying to get the main character to come to terms with who she was. She was fighting, fighting who she was at every turn. And this book is like, look, you can't run from who you are and who your family is. And the only way to handle hardship is to ask them for help, rather they're dead or alive. So I really appreciated those parts. And I also want to say for um, Blood on the Tracks, there is also some um, violence also that you want to be aware as well. So let me just do a, a mini little check in here. Everybody here, everybody can hear me. Okay. Um, okay. So when the reckoning comes, so when when the reckoning comes is a book that is set um, in a plantation in the South, and let me let me be honest with y'all, I often have a difficult time, difficult time reading books that is set in a plantation near a plantation. I'd be like, ah, I gotta head out. However, this one is taking you on a spin. So you're following the story of this young woman and she is with her daughter and I think her daughter is less than 10 and she is working for this plantation that has like different tourist attractions and she's working for this family, this white family and she is making sure that events go and like things run smoothly on the plantation grounds. I was already like rolling my eye that you know, white folks was actually planning their wedding at a plantation, okay? But we all know in the year of our Lord, 2023, that we're currently in, people are still doing that foolishness, okay? So, back to the story. So, the main character um, wakes up one morning, essentially, finds somebody dead, and shit hits the fan. So, she actually have training and, um, like being a lawyer. Uh, I can't remember or not if she's actually a lawyer, but I think she's like a lawyer adjacent, but not really, you know what I mean? And she is like trying to snoop. It's kind of give, it's giving amateur detective of her trying to figure out what happened to this um, dead body or this person who was found dead um, at the plantation. And they're going through all different type of suspects who could and could be there. Um, but then you find out that they're, is more insidious things than you would have originally thought of. Like there's some parts in the book where it's kind of hinted, but it's not really set in, t in stone into the last 25% of the book, which I love. So it's kind of like a mixture of a slow and fast paced thriller. Um, and I, I really appreciated it because there's sometimes when I read thrillers, it's just giving slow pace or just fast and I just felt like this book had a good mixture of being slow when it needed to be and being fast when it needed to be and giving you enough information to keep you engaged in the story 
and to understand how this person can be a suspect, how that person can be the suspect. I will say in this story, my favorite character was the main character's daughter. Um, she just, to me, felt like the one who was the most insightful and the one who just really knew what was going on in the plantation. And I think a lot of people just would brush past her because she was a kid, but she was a small kid who can see things. And a lot of times, you know, even parents and adults do things in front of children and they think they don't see them. And this is an example of like, just because you think this kid don't see things, this kid sees things and maybe they have information that can be really valuable to um, something as tragic as finding someone dead on the plantation. All right. Something is killing the children. This year with the comics, um, the Realm of Comics book club, Ashley and I read, I think, quite a bit of this comic series. I'm blanking and I apologize um, of when, like the volume that we left off on. This follows the story of this um, girl and she has like, I think white hair or blonde hair and like red eyes or orange eyes, something like that. And um, she is going out and trying to figure out what is happening to these children. These children are being murdered by these monsters and it is her job and people who is a part of her world to stop these monsters from continuing to kill people um, and murder people. And um, she's really good at her job. <laughs> but I will say um, it is very important to me to suggest to you to also read House of Slaughter because that is also in this world. And I just felt like reading them both together just, re just enhanced my reading experience of experiencing something is killing the children. There is a lot of gore in this comic. So if goreness is, is not your thing to see, this ain't, this ain't it for you. But if you're looking for like a fast paced horror, that's just gonna just, just give a little salt bay action into the world of horror. I think this is a good comic to pick up. Um, sometimes I can't, I can't, um, trust my own recommendation when I'd be like, you know, you should pick this up because I just like reading horror. So somebody else could be like, no, Brie, this was devastating. So if this was devastating, I totally get it. Um, I want y'all in the chat to let me know um, which of these you have read already and if you've read any of those. Jackal. Jackal, Jackal, Jackal. So I will be interviewing this author next Friday. So be ready with your questions. Um, if any of y'all have like questions that you would like for me to consider to ask Aaron, please um, slide in my DM on Twitter or Instagram. So Jackal follows the story of, how do I describe Jackal? Jackal is broken up into different sections if you ever read the book. And each section is pertaining to a black young girl who's been missing and murdered. And it follows the story of this Haitian American young girl who was just trying to figure out what's going on in life. And she's also trying to figure out how to deal with her relationship with her mother. And she is, you know, telling people like, hey, you know, I'm seeing something is happening. She uh, is reporting different things to different folks. And, you know, just trying to be like, you know, I think something is happening in this town. And she is also not trusting her memory, not trusting other people's memory. It's a lot of like unreliable things that's going on. What I took from this story the most was the name of the book. And I'm not going to spoil this. I'm trying not to spoil it. If you understand what jackal means in different um, African diaspora uh, stories or myths, it makes sense why the ending happened. And often I hear the critique of this book of people being like, oh my God, I don't, I don't think the author knew what she was writing or it was totally different 
or, you know, it was two different books in one. And I just felt like if you had that knowledge or go back and read it, you see Jackal right there <laughs> on my, on my show. If you go back and read it, um, like the ending makes sense to me. And that's, that's all I will say about it without, uh, spoiling too much about it. And this is also a debut novel. Um, hold on. There we go. Did I do it? Okay, cool. My Sweet Girl. Another book by Amanda Jayatisa. Uh, My Sweet Girl is following the story of two little girls in Sri Lanka, living it up. Boom, boom, boom. And they are like best friends living it up, okay? And they're in this orphanage, um, and they are trying to just be the best little girls as possible so that they can get adopted. And one of them gets adopted, and she is, we follow her life and what's happening to her and how she is adjusting to being in America, what that looks like, um, having white parents, um, you know, trying to stay as mentally sound as possible. But this is another one like um, Jackal where their own memories is being put into question. It's just unreliable. So what I've learned last year is that I love an unreliable narrator or an unreliable, um, what is it, like character. Like they are not trusting anything. They're feeling like they're quote unquote crazy and that they're just not together. Um, and I really appreciated that about this book. This book had so many twists in it that I don't think I was quite ready for because like I said, and, um, you're invited, what you think you're seeing is not really what you think you're seeing. I will say one critique about this is one of the main characters in this book being in her voice is a bit annoying. You're just like, Oh my God, <sighs> it kind of reminds me of Suki Stackhouse, but not to that extent, but it's, it can be a bit just like, okay, we get it. We get it. I do think I enjoyed your invited a bit more than my sweet girl, but I also really enjoy them and will reread them both and will recommend them anytime, you know? Um, hold on. Okay. We're talking about Moriarty. So Moriarty is one of my favorite mangas. I've talked about this before if you've been on my channel. It is just a retelling of Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty, figuring things out, figuring out different clues. It's following the story of um, Moriarty, specifically on Moriarty. Sherlock does appear, but the focus is Moriarty. And um, Moriarty is trying to be like, hey, we need to attack systems of oppression and make them pay and you follow in each volume of how they're going about doing that infiltrating certain groups or secretive groups disbanding them um it could be <clears throat> setting people up for the murder of x y and z it can even be killing folks i will say this is a bit darker than the sherlock holmes uh, retellings that I'm used to reading. This is on the bit darker side, but going through like the different cases or different uh, just things that Moriarty want to disband was very enjoyable for me and my reading experience. Going to Lakewood. Lakewood was giving me like, let me show you another like Tuskegee adjacent experiment that goes wrong. So it follows the main story, the main, um, the main character. And I, you know me, I have a hard time remember main characters names. It follows the main character who is trying to pretty much be there for her mom emotionally and financially. Her mom is sick and you know, medical bills is piling up and she got to do what she got to do to get these coins. Okay, she got to do what she got to do to pay that rent. 
So she signs up for this experiment. She don't know much about this experiment. It's a very secretive, secretive experiment. She can't really tell anybody about this experiment. But they are handing out the dough, rolling out the dough. And as she continues to do this experiment that she believes um, is only for a short time and a good time, she then start to uncover some secrets and different things about this experiment that she didn't realize was present. She's starting to understand more things about herself. She's starting to understand more things about people who are close to her and their um, relationship to her and possibly to the experiment as well. Moving on to The House of Transcendence. Y'all know this is one of my favorite books of 2022. It follows the story of this queer necromancer who is going to figure out what happened to one of the houses in the House of uh, Transcendence, the head woman, figure out what happened to her partner, right? So she's going around. She's trying to figure out what's happening to this partner. It's a very magical feel. The atmosphere that is written in this book was done very well. It also pays homage to um, uh, down in the valley where the girls get naked. If she throwing bad thing, you know she going to shake it. P Valley. I know. I know you're waiting on me to reveal that big reveal for P Valley. Um, because the head in the House of Transcendence own a shrimp joint. Um, and they doing things to pay that rent. But, like I said, the main character is kind of like a amateur sleuth, and she's a necromancer, and she has to figure out what's going on. And it has some very, like, horror aspects to it, because while she's trying to figure these things out, she is being put in predicaments or in situations that is very dangerous for her. But I love the pace of this book. And I really hope that this turns into a series because this would be phenomenal because there are three other houses, um, if memory serves me right. And I'm just so interested to hear about those other houses. It's kind of similar to my curiosity of House of Hunger. I just want to know what's going on in the other houses because I'm nosy. I am. I am. I am. I am. Okay. All right. Firekeeper's Daughter is, how do I say, this is a story of a young indigenous girl who at times don't feel that she's indigenous enough due to the color of her skin. And because of her, the color of her skin, she is aware of the privileges that is afforded to her um, being an indigenous person in this community in Wisconsin. And um, she is giving an opportunity to kind of help her community, but she has to do it with people she never thought that she would be um, in cahoots, I guess, with. And she does this while also fighting this internal, um, what is it like, this internal battle of being like, is this really something that's going to help my people? Is this something that's going to affect my people negatively? She is really trying to behave in a way that corresponds with being a firekeeper's daughter. And it is heartbreaking and um, affirming in so many ways because you watch her try to figure out what is plaguing her community um, and how she can go about helping her community. And she's thinking about her future, other people's future, and how she can help um, this, you know, people that she's working with, how she can help them um, and help herself, help her community so that they can decrease, you know, suicidal rates and decrease alcohol and drug use and um, really turn to those cultural practices as mythologies of healing. That is what I took from this book. Eden's Ever Dark is a middle grade horror. Shout out to Ashley from Ashley from Bookish Realm 
on putting this book on my radar. This is a fantastic middle grade horror. It is actually <laughs> quite creepy if we're being honest. And it follows the story of Eden. Thank God. Thank God we have a name and I can roll with it. Okay. Um, Eden is have to go back to where her family is from in the Caribbean, specifically her mom. She lost her mom. Mom passed away. And why? that's another reason why I think it's a good book because there are young people who lose a parent, a parent that they love. So this is a great book to show you a, a way in which a young person can grieve. And she goes to her, you know, Caribbean family's home and find out all these different things about her mother that she never knew existed. But as she is snooping and asking questions and trying to figure things out, she finds herself in a different realm and being stalked by this woman who is scaring the living shit out of her. So now she is stuck in this realm, stuck with different tools and trying to figure out what to do and how to get back to where her father is at. But it's, it's a hard thing to do. She's learning a lot about herself, learning a lot about spirits, different type of spirits, and also learning a lot about herself and her human existence. And I think this book is a great example of teaching young people about how grief can fester if we don't address it, how grief can be so big and it fills up a room and, and we feel like there's no escape. And it also can show how grief can also be a pathway to healing if you let it and how important it is to ask other people for help or to seek out help when you're grieving. Confessions. Oh, round of applause, y'all. Round of applause. Confession came on my radar from Kayla from uh, Books and Lala, and it was one of her literally dead book club picks. I was like, Bree, say that right. And um, this book follows the story of this teacher, right? She starts off being like, hey, welcome, students. We're in this class. We're going to talk about something that happened. And she is just talking about this story. And people in the class is like, huh, what is, what is she talking about? So the more she keeps talking and the more things she reveals, you realize a grave crime has happened and one of the suspects may or may not be in her classroom. But the way it is revealed and the way that it is written was Chef Kiss. Chef Kiss. What a, what a beautiful pick. Okay. Let's see here. So we got Blanche on the Lamb. This is a series that I read. It kind of gave me, um, te it kind of, wait, what is that movie that, what is it called? The Maid, I think. Um, I just kept thinking of the main character as being Viola Davis. I just, I couldn't get it out of my head. And it follows the story of this woman who may or may not witness a crime. And she's like, look. I got to find a job, save my job, figure out what happened because they're not going to blame it on this black woman. I'm not going to jail for something I didn't com I, I didn't do. But what adds to this um, book is that, you know, she's an amateur sleuth. She's trying to figure things out. She's living in a very like, you know, 1960s kind of vibe, I believe. Uh, Y'all would have to double check. And, um, I can double check later too, but she's living in a world where it's different from what we have now. And like, you know, white folks is, is white folk in, in a more overt way, I would say. And she has to find a job and the one of the only jobs she can get is being a maid, but she got to, you know, lie, fib, kind of extend the truth a little bit just so she can save her life. And just so she can get enough money so she can head out and, and she want to get in New York. She's like, look, I need to get my coins, get out of here because they're not going to blame this murder on me. And she's trying to figure out, you know, who did it again, 
amateur schools, which is also like one of my things. All Her Little Secrets. All Her Little Secrets to me is a book that I wish um, another book could be. And I'm blanking on the name because I didn't like the book and I purposely didn't want to remember. But if I do, I'll put it in the comment section when I am done talking about these books. So All Her Little Secrets follows this young woman. She is the only black lawyer at her firm and everybody else is white. And one day she goes to work and she see that her boss is dead. The man is gone. Oh, he been traveling on this road too long, too long. He is dead and gone. The man is done. So she's like, ah, uh -uh. they ain't about to get my black ass. I'm gonna head out. However, there is some insidious shit going on in this firm. There is some you know, white supremacist stuff going on. There's this, there's that. There's people being sneaky. There's racism. There are people outside of the firm, right? Screaming no justice, no peace because of the foolish actions that the, firms has, that the firm has done. So she is trying to save her job, live up to the minority myth, and also try to figure out what happened to her brother. Where's her brother? where he's at and in the process of trying to protect herself protect her job protect her image she is being faced with like am i a sellout you know like i'm the only black person here there's black people out there outside the job pr protesting and being like what's going on and then she has to go home from where she's at like i think it was the middle of somewhere georgia and then she realized that there were some things that happened in her past that correlate to what's happening in, in the future. And now she has to make some pretty tough decisions on what to do moving forward as, again, the only black woman, black person at this firm. And she also has to ask herself, you know, will a dollar make me holler? That's what it boils down to. Will a dollar make me holler? Amen. Moving on to Creep. Y'all, let me tell you right here. Content warning of stalking. I personally, I also want to say in all her secrets, content warning of cheating. And then in confessions, content warning of a child's death. So, in Creep, follow the story of this young woman and she is out here essentially living her life and i think she she might be middle aged too that's young and she is a teacher and she has a student that she's a rocky rocky knock it up boots okay but she's in love with this dude this big texan who want to hold her console her and be with her you know she out here married i mean engaged but she keep getting the feeling that somebody out here are being creep, right? Also, she really got a stalker. You know what I mean? She don't know who the stalker is. She's trying to brush things off. You know, her and, and her student aide rocking, knocking the boots. That situation is becoming unclear, ain't right. Then one day, she goes missing. And that's just really what happened. And then you got to read the book to figure the rest out. What I will say is, this book was done really well. Um, I will say the writing was good. The suspense was A1 because it kept you on your seat. It kept, like, as the reader, me, I kept thinking, like, oh, my God, maybe it's this person. No, 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 it's not that person. But it could be this person. And then when I find out, I'm like, but still the math ain't math and like what's going on? So it's constantly you're like, I don't know who did it, but there's an undertone that everybody did it, but you know it's not everybody. So you have to like really do that work of trying to like figure out who's out here doing it. Um, so I do want to say, you know, be aware of that. I know a lot of people don't like, you know, stalking in their books. I don't. 
Um, this was like the only book where I was like, okay, I can deal with it. It didn't feel um, like, yeah, stalking is scary, but it didn't feel the type of stalking that I've read in like other books that made me DNF it. Um, and we also read this book for um, Prime Readers of Color with Cache from Shade with the Hobbies. So this is, you know, where we're at. Um, these are all my books. Uh, I think it's like 18 of them. My best crime fiction of 2022. Uh, let me know if there's any books that, you know, you're feeling you like. Um, do you think that I could have explained something a, a bit more? Do you have questions? I can definitely give them to you. Try my best not to spoil things. And I feel like I spoil things. If you're watching this on the replay, um, just know there will be time stamped below. Um, and I am going to time stamp things below for all of the videos I'm doing for my end of the year content because they'll be live. So yeah, that's that on that and that on period. Um, and you know, things had to be said. So let me go into the chat, um, and, and talk. Cause I was just like, blah, blah, blah. okay. Okay. Shay says she read most of these. We excited for that interview. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. At least see something is killing the children was a great series. I also loved when the reckoning comes. It was so powerful. I agree. Happy Hunts Library. Belle said that um, something is killing the children. I read volumes one through four. Don't know if there are any more volumes after that. It's um, it's more issues. I don't know if a volume has come out yet, but there is more issues. Well, Jackal, I have, but haven't read yet. Um, I've never even heard of this book, Erin. I need to read Lakewood, but it's going to piss you off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Ulysses, please pick up Moriarty. Um, Kim from Native Lady Book with Warrior. <laughs> Warrior said that um, she liked Lakewood. Whitney, the reader fan. Hey. Um, such a good read in the House of Transcendence. Yes, yes. And the Fire's Keeper Daughter. Definitely good reads. Anisha Reed said Firekeeper's daughter was amazing, fast-paced, and had so many interesting conversations, coming of age, womanhood, community, and role of elders need to preserve Native cultures. Yep, agreed. Um, I hope you're adding some of these things to your list. Um, Kay Olson, darn, I didn't get the notification that you were live. Here I am watching your reading sprints back from two weeks ago. I love that. I love that. Creep sounds messy in a great way. Exactly, Anisha Reeves. It was, I wanted to say more things about Creep, but I felt like it, it would have just spoiled it more. It would have spoiled it more. Um, no Walter Mosley crime fiction. Yeah, I didn't read any Walter Mosley this year. Um, I do plan on fixing that this year. Or did I miss it when I read it? Like, like you, you barred it? Or you went and dropped off the grounds at the pool. Whichever way, you got to put your bowels first. You know what I mean? Um, hey, Kathleen. Yeah, I didn't read any um, Walter Mosley this year. Um, I think I was just like in a rabbit race of trying to read uh, more new releases because I tend to read a lot of like backlist books. So that's my bad. I'm definitely going to check out Fire's Keeper's Daughter because I need more indigenous titles. Yeah. That was really good. I had so many good books that I wanted to include. And I had to cut it off because it was like 50 books. And I said, no, I had to choose. I got to choose. Um, I didn't even choose some of my Stephen Graham Jones. Uh, those are honorable mentions. Anyway. Thank you all for um, uh, rocking with me um, and, you know, just hanging out with me in this live as I talk about uh, the best crime fiction of 2022. Um, I hope you like this setup um, that I'm doing. 
I just don't have the energy to sit down and film and post. So I'm just going to do a live. So just so y'all know, um, tomorrow, hold on, let me pull it up. So tomorrow at 1 p.m., I'll be talking about the best books of 2022. These are all books that are not crime fiction. I wanted to pull out crime fiction specifically and then talk about the other books. So then that would be at 1. And then at 7 or 6, so let's aim for 7 but or 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, I will be on again tomorrow talking about the biggest disappointment books of 2022. So, you know, let's buckle up and get ready for that. Um, and I have to put, like, do what I did here with the book covers right here. I didn't put the book covers into the system yet for um, the best books of 2022 and the biggest disappointments. But it is there. And then Sunday sometime, I haven't figured out when because I haven't finished the thumbnail. I am going to be talking about stats. I love talking about stats. And we can just, you know, talk about what I'm reading there. All right. I love Alive, too. I do. Who's the authors of Confession? Let's go there. Let's go to Confession. Um, Kanai Minato. And shout out to um, Emma Ray from Emma Ray Empowered for helping me with this setup. Um, and also shout out to um, Allie from Hard hardback paperback y'all know who I'm talking about um for like you know making sure uh this is possible so it's probably going to be the same setup um for the next couple um vlogs right amen amen um I'm also thinking about vlogging again picking that up again um and and doing that you know once or twice a month um, haven't decided if, if that's a good idea or not. Um, cause this year I want to like do more intentional content versus just random stuff. Um, and make sure it's, it's engaging and I rather be live anyway than sit here and have to record this and all that. But I'm going to try to have the time stamps up for all the books I talked about. If you wanted to go back. And, and see what I was talking about for each of these books. I will try to have that up for you, uh, the timestamps, um, sometime uh, tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. I think tonight I'm going to put my body into um, one of my massager things and, and watch Charm and work on a paper that's due on Sunday. That's really called self-care. You know what I mean? Amen. Amen. Oh, not y'all loving my vlogs. Don't do too. Don't don't make me look somewhere. I'm so glad uh, Nisha reads that you added more books to your TBR. I'm also sad, but you know you gotta put you first. Miss most of this, but going back and seeing some books, um, love to read, and some I have. Black Queen, yeah, Black Queen really came with some bangers last year. I can't wait. I'm bursting from the seams to show y'all um, what's going to be happening for Black Arena Thon this year. Um, also, Black Arena's trademark. ba da bum Bow. Um, so I'm definitely going to continue my love for crime fiction. I do think this year I'll be reading a bit more nonfiction. Um, I thought that I would be reading a bunch of fiction this year. I mean, this month. Um, but... I have a lot of nonfiction that I'm in the middle of. Um, I'm reading uh, The Myth of Normal. I think I might make that a live show to like talk to y'all as a therapist about this um, and like, you know, put up some questions and we can talk about The Myth of Normal, That's which deals with trauma, illness, and healing in a toxic culture. If that sounds something that y'all are interested in, me doing a live show and talking about that. From a, from a mental health perspective. Um, I'm also reading this book called Tired as Fuck by Caroline Dooner. And I'm also reading Trauma Stewardship by Laura Van Denote Lipsky. So, you know, doing all of that. All right. I think I'm going to do a vlog. 
try to get a blog up sometime this month. Um, yeah, and again, thank y'all, and uh, have a wonderful day, the rest of your day. I hope you are living your best life and doing what you can, and I will see y'all tomorrow at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time to talk about the best books of 2022, excluding the crime fiction, and um, we'll come back at 6 or 7 and do disappointment reads, and then I just don't know what time to set my live on Sunday. Um, for the uh, the stats of 2022, have a wonderful day. I gotta figure out how to how to end this vlog. It's like, do you stop streaming or end broadcast? I I, I don't know which one to do. But anyway.